Hello, podcast listeners. Jordan River here. We have returned from our trip to Colombia, and we gathered so much great content and footage. It was truly an incredible experience. And you guys are going to hear all about it on the recap show, and I'm going to release some of the content that I recorded down there here on the podcast. Lots of great stuff coming your way. But today we have a brand new episode to tide you over. I apologize for the interruption in the regularly scheduled programming. So today we're going to do the very first episode of Coffee History. I'm very proud of this piece, and I know you'll enjoy it. Let's jump right into the show. Thank you all for listening. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share the Coffee Health and Science Podcast with a friend, with a peer, with a colleague. Make sure you're subscribed. Give us a good rating and review. We always appreciate that from you listeners. Today's episode is the first episode of Coffee History, a new segment that I'll be doing designed to help you better understand the origins of this incredible plant and this incredible drink that is now such a fixture in human society. Today's episode focuses on how coffee came to the Americas in the 1720s, the journey that it had to take across the Atlantic from Europe to the Caribbean. And it is truly a story of epic proportions, revolving around a single man named Gabriel de Clou, whose sheer dogged determination was the only thing that allowed for the migration of this valuable seedling. De Clou risked his own life to preserve his precious coffee plant cutting, coming up against fierce storms, severe drought, and even pirates during his amazing journey to the Americas. So grab a mug of coffee, sit back and relax while I regale you with the tale straight out of coffee history. But before we discuss De Clou's incredible adventure, I thought it would be beneficial to give a brief coffee history crash course to lead us up to where we are in the early 1700s in this story. Shiny leaves of an unfamiliar tree. Caldy decided to try some himself, and when he did, he joined the dancing goats and became, quote, the happiest herder in happy Arabia, end quote. Sometime after that, a monk was passing by and observed Caldy and his herd of goats. When Caldi told the monk about the coffee cherries, the monk thought that they could be the answer to his prayers. It seemed that this monk was literally falling asleep in the middle of his prayers, but when he ate the coffee cherries, he managed to stay awake. This unnamed monk came up with the idea of drying and boiling the berries to make a beverage. His fellow monks loved the new drink because it encouraged them to pray and it tasted good too. So this was the legend of the origins of coffee. And as you can see, coffee has really been a sacred and protected plant from its very origins, and it's remained a kind of secretive commodity and a very valuable protected one for quite some time after this, both the plant itself and the knowledge of how to grow it properly and brew it into drinkable coffee. And this knowledge and the plant itself slowly traveled from culture to culture over the years. We're going to explore on these coffee history episodes many different times when coffee was illegalized or banned or hoarded or protected. It's very, very, very fascinating. Around the 14th century, Arabians were tired of the Ethiopian coffee monopoly, and they were tired of going to Ethiopia for their caffeine fix. So they began cultivating coffee on their own. Plants were smuggled out of Ethiopia and grown in the region that is Yemen today. Theft and smuggling have become an integral part of coffee's history for the reason that it is so protected and so beloved. And as coffee grew and grew in popularity, the Arabians sought to protect their precious commodity. The powerful Ottoman Empire enjoyed a monopoly on coffee that they weren't keen to give up for quite some time. However, one man, an Ottoman ambassador to France, Suleiman Aga, introduced coffee to the court of King Louis XIV, who loved all things opulent and luxurious, would end up playing a very important role in the history of coffee. And while coffee wasn't an instant hit, eventually the drink caught on, and taxing this commodity looked like a great way to replenish the kingdom's coffers. Now, sometime in the late 1600s or early 1700s, the mayor of Amsterdam gifted King Louis with a coffee plant of his own, and this was an incredible gift and really demonstrates the great lengths that those in power resorted to to possess this plant and to hold on to it. Dutch traders procured this particular plant from the Arabian port of Mocha through some difficulty, 
and it sailed to Java and was finally brought to Holland. From there, it traveled overland to Paris and finally brought coffee to France and eventually the New World. Understanding the great importance of this gift, Louis had the first greenhouse in Europe constructed to house the plant, which flowered eventually and bore fruit and cuttings. Again, this was a very protected plant intended only to be consumed by the elite. But little did the court know that this humble tree would later become the mother plant of all the Arabica plants in the New World, single-handedly thanks to today's protagonist, Gabriel de Clou. So now, here we are, in 1723 France. Enter Normandy-born Frenchman and naval officer Gabriel de Clou. Gabriel was well-traveled because of his naval experience, and had been stationed on the Caribbean island of Martinique for quite some time. Clou also saw the massive potential fortune that was the coffee trade. Europeans crazed over coffee. It was a luxury item. The Ottomans and Arabians had a monopoly over the supply and the trade. He was also aware, as we said before, that he was in the same country that the few precious royal European coffee plants were also being cultivated. So Gabriel concocts this plan to steal a cutting off of a royal coffee plant, smuggle it out of France, across the Atlantic Ocean, and get it to Martinique, where he could transplant it, grow it, and eventually supply enough cuttings for a plantation. Whilst on leave in Paris in 1723, Gabriel's first mission was to obtain a coffee cutting from a coffee plant. And this was an incredibly difficult task, as we said, because the only plants in France that were being grown at that time were under the guarded care of the king's botanist. This is the only coffee tree you can find in France, and to steal from the royal greenhouse was a grave crime punishable by death. Gabriel cleverly overcame this problem by seducing a lady of the court who in turn used her charms on the royal physician. This royal physician acquired a small coffee cutting for de Clou. So here we have Gabriel de Clou, who has already risked death and has managed to acquire a coffee seedling from a cutting from King Louis's royal coffee plant. In preparation for the long voyage to the Americas, Gabriel de Clou designed and had made a small glass box to house the plant on the ship's deck. This special glass box would protect the seedling from the salt spray and the elements, but still keep it warm and allow the sun's rays in. De Clou took his seedling, placed it in his special glass box, and quickly boarded a ship back to Martinique. During his voyage back to Martinique, Gabriel faced a whole host of problems. The first involved a fellow passenger. De Clou always kept his special glass box near him. He had it in his quarters, but he took it out from time to time to give it exposure to the sun. One day in the process of doing this, however, he got the attention of a jealous Dutch passenger. One night, while Gabriel slept, the Dutchman snuck into his room and snapped off a piece of the coffee chute. When de Clou discovered what had happened, the Dutchman had already disembarked for Madeira. But his fellow passengers were the least of de Clou's problems. Some time after the incident with the Dutchman, de Clou's ship faced an attack from marauding Barbary Corsair pirates. These were professional pirates from Tunisia, and their goal was to take your loot or take you back to their home as a slave. If these Barbary Corsairs managed to board the ship, de Clou would have definitely lost his coffee plant, or worse, his life. But the captain of their ship was brave and skilled enough to lose the pirates on the open sea. However, because of the maneuvering needed to evade the pirates, the ship had shifted and de Clou's glass box was damaged. De Clou had survived the pirate attack, but his mind was on his coffee plant, and now he had a broken glass box. He quickly sought out a carpenter on the ship to repair his special container. As if all of this wasn't bad enough, after the pirate attack in the middle of the Atlantic, De Clou's ship became truly unfortunate because out of the middle of nowhere, the ship was confronted with a violent hurricane. The ship was tossed and damaged, but it managed to survive. De Clou's cargo, however, was not so lucky. The box filled with salty seawater, and it made De Clou worry that the plant might die. 
What's worse, the ship lost one very precious commodity during the storm, a lot of its fresh water on board. Much of the supply of fresh water was either lost at sea or contaminated by seawater during the hurricane. So now the ship and its crew faced a shortage of water and they had to ration the supply among the passengers and crew. You might think this would be enough to stop DeClue, but DeClue cherished his coffee shoot more than his own life. Even though he had little fresh water to ration, and even though the plant was already damaged and likely not to survive, he shared what little fresh water he had with his coffee shoot to keep it alive during the rest of the voyage. Through all of these incredible, incredible hardships, Gabriel DeClue managed to get through and managed to arrive in Martinique. He traveled to a plantation in Martinique, and he planted his coffee shoot and waited for it to mature. Along the way, he had guards guarding this shoot literally 24-7. And DeClue's determination and patience bore fruit. The coffee tree matured and became a source of the seeds for even more coffee trees. And almost a decade later, in 1730, Martinique began to export coffee back to France. In addition to all this, Gabriel shared shoots off of his coffee tree to his friends. And in turn, his friends brought it back to Jamaica and Santo Domingo and Guadalupe, where coffee plantations also arose. It was even said that a shoot from de Clue's tree reached Brazil and became the ancestor of many coffee trees there. But this is in dispute and considered by many to be a legend. Eventually, the king of France noticed the coffee industry in the Caribbean. King Louis XIV was dead already, and King Louis XV, a coffee enthusiast, summoned de Clou. Interestingly enough, de Clou was actually rewarded for his deeds in developing the coffee industry in the Caribbean. His act of stealing from the royal greenhouse was, of course, overlooked. And that, my friends, is the legend of how coffee came to the Americas. So the next time you American listeners are sitting down to enjoy your cup of joe, raise your mug to one Gabriel de Clou, who risked life and limb to bring the precious gift of coffee to you and I across North America. I want to thank you all for tuning in today. If you enjoyed this coffee history episode, please share it with a friend. I sure would appreciate that. Special shout out to Searching in History for their article on the adventure of Gabriel de Clou, a very good overview that helped me put this episode together. And of course, thank you all so much for subscribing, rating, and reviewing. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. This is Jordan River signing off, wishing you an extraordinary day. We'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast for more coffee history. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.